Welcome everyone, and thanks for joining this week's SDEC session. My name is Adam Greco, and I'm with Search Discovery, and I'll be moderating behind the scenes for today's session. Uh, before we get into the session, I'm going to just go through a couple housekeeping items, and then I'll turn it over to Ali. So, uh, Ali, you want to hit to the next slide? Um, so for those who are new to the SDEC, we are a free educational community covering topics related to digital analytics, digital marketing. On the screen, you can see all of the topic areas that we have. And if you aren't part of the group, um, I'm going to be putting some information in the chat that gives you easy links where you can join the group for free. And you can always update the topics. If you're getting too many meeting invites or too few, you could always update that by just sending me a DM in the Slack group or emailing, and I'll put my email address there as well. And then next slide. Uh, one thing that I will recommend that you do, um, if you are a member of the SDEC, is join our Slack group. Unfortunately, we only have 68% of you in the Slack group. Um, we have now, after today, we're going to have 70 past webinar recordings that you can take advantage of. You also can see job postings and you can DM other SDEC members. And uh, we're at about 4,000 uh, plus members, so there's lots of great people. Um, if you have any concerns or questions about getting into the SDEC or the Slack group, you can always email sdec at searchdiscovery.com. And again, I'll be putting all this in the chat. During the webinar, if you have questions about the SDC, you can hit me up in the chat. But if you have questions for Ali, it really helps us a lot if instead of putting those in the chat, you click on the Zoom Q&A. That makes it really easy for us to go through all those questions at the end of the session. And as always, this webinar will be recorded and it'll be posted later in the Slack group. In this case, since this one is under our data science channel, uh, it'll be in the it'll be in that Slack channel. So that's it for the housekeeping. Um, I'd like oh actually one last thing uh, one last thing I forgot. Um, we were nominated uh, through me in some weird way. Uh, someone nominated me, but I think they really meant to nominate the SDEC in the Digital Analytics Association Quanti Awards, which is kind of like the Oscars for the digital analytics space. Um, unfortunately, I don't think there was a group one that this fell into. So someone was nice enough to nominate me, but I'm really just a vessel for the SDEC. So if you are a member for the DAA, we'd love to get some more spotlight put on the SDEC. So uh, you can go ahead and vote for the for me through the SDEC. And I put a QR code that takes you to the DAA. Um, unfortunately, voting is only for DAA members. So that's it. Um, now I'm going to hand it off to Ali. Ali, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. And I will hand it off to you. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I'm Ali Vanderveld. I'm a senior data science lead at Amazon Web Services. And today I'm going to talk to you about how we can use machine learning to model churn and customer value. So just a quick agenda um, for what I'm going to cover today. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about, first of all, what, how do we define churn and customer lifetime value and, and why modeling those are hard, but definitely not impossible. Um, I'll also go through some modeling strategies. In particular, I'm going to focus on the most straightforward one uh, for most of the time. And then uh, I'll say a little bit about, like, once you do have a model, once you are predicting these things, what do you do with that information? Uh, that's something that's also not super straightforward. And then I'll be sure to leave a lot of time for Q&A. So just a little bit about my background. Uh, I, I have a PhD in theoretical astrophysics from Cornell, and then I spent six years as an academic researcher. So didn't even know what churn or customer lifetime modeling was back then. But then in 2013, I made the switch to data science. Uh, so I spent uh, in total five and a half years in e-commerce. So about half of that was at Groupon, and then about half of that was at Shopperner. And then um, I've also spent an additional two and a half years in the public sector. And uh, part of that has been at Civis Analytics, which is the local Chicago consulting firm. And then the other half so far has been at AWS. And so there I've worked on 
a broad variety of, of use cases for machine learning, including in education, politics, nonprofits, and government use cases. So in my current role, I'm the technical lead for a team that focuses on language AI for the public sector at AWS. I'm not gonna talk about that today. Today, I'm gonna to focus on work that I did in my prior life in e-commerce. So to just talk about what churn and customer value are, um, churn modeling is typically defined as um, trying to predict when people will leave your service. So if you have, um, I'm gonna be talking about e-commerce a lot here. So for example, if you have an e-commerce site where people can buy products in a marketplace, um, it's like for example, we uh, have a shop runner, um, when someone churns, that means that they had been an active customer for some period of time, and now they're not an active customer anymore. And then uh, in similarly, customer lifetime value also involves predicting the future customer behavior. And that's for a given customer, how much are they going to spend over the rest of their lifetime using your service? So if someone churns, that means their customer value will be zero. If someone does not churn, then they will have some non-zero customer value. So between some sort of churn probability you can predict and a predicted customer value, it gives you a really good uh, understanding for each customer of, first of all, how tenuous their relationship with you is, but then also how valuable they are predicted to be in the future. And those two I'll, I'll talk about soon are, are interrelated numbers. They're not completely independent. But one of the things that makes this hard is that most times when people are predicting churn, they're not doing it within the context of a service that has a concrete unsubscribe action. So that's a lot easier to predict. If someone has to actually hit an unsubscribe button or ask to not be in your service anymore, then it's a lot easier to predict because churn now corresponds to a discrete user action that you have data on. Unfortunately, for most use cases, like the shop runner e-commerce example, um, you don't have a specific unsubscribe action. What you're trying to predict is, is basically the absence of an action. You're trying to predict when that customer stops using your service. But it's not always obvious when that's happened. So for example, I showed this timeline here of a hypothetical customer. They initially um, you know, register with your site, like they put in their um, you know, personal information they, so they can get good recommendations. They give you their address and credit card information. They're happy. Um, they might purchase, click some emails, purchase again, view some pages on your site. This is the kind of data that you'll collect about that customer over time. But let's say something makes them unhappy at some point and they don't tell you. They usually don't tell you and they just kind of stop coming back. So at what point do you decide that they're churned? Um, let's say they usually purchased once a month. So if they go two months without using your service, does that mean that they've churned? Um, do you wait? if you know, someone stops using for a few months, um, at what point do you make this decision? And so this data set is what we call right censored because you don't know the ultimate fate here of that customer. You can't see far enough out in the future to know if they for real, really truly never came back to you. And you have a similar situation with customer lifetime value. You don't really know if someone stops buying for a while if they stop forever. They could come back later and buy some more. So once again, you're in the same situation where you're trying to predict something that's really far in the future where you don't necessarily have the data. Um, so, you know, for example, if a customer doesn't buy from you for five years and then they make a purchase, did they ever really churn? Not really, because they came back. And if you think about it, you're probably going to churn from everything you use online. So if you think about like every app you use right now, what are the odds that you're going to be using any of those when you're you know, 80 years old? So, so in reality, 
we all churn at some point, um, but it's a hard thing to predict. But the reason why it's not really as hard as we might think is because if we think about how we use those scores, it turns out that an imperfect prediction actually gets you all the way there. So when we predict if someone's gonna churn or not, we usually get out some sort of score between zero and one, where closer to one means they're more likely to churn. Closer to zero means they're less likely to churn. It's not necessarily a probability, but it gives you um, an ability to rank your customers. And that's usually what these scores are used for. And that's what I'm gonna recommend at the end as well. So if you have these customers and they have churn scores of, you know, from zero to one, what you're really interested in is who are the people most likely to churn? Who are the people least likely to churn? Who are those people in the middle that kind of need a nudge to buy again? It's that ranking that tends to be the most important thing. So if you're predicting if someone's gonna buy again in the next three months or the next six months or the next year, um, the scores are gonna change, but the overall ranking's not. So let's say we predict if someone's gonna churn in the next three months, and we see that Jane here has a higher score than John. If we then change to predict churn in the next six months, they're not gonna flip. That's gonna be very, you, your model will probably be very, very weird if it changes the ranking based on that time horizon over which you're predicting someone's churn. So what this means is at a very utilitarian level, uh, if you're trying to predict people's churn probabilities, you really only need to do it over some finite window that will give you this kind of ranking that you can leverage. And again, I'm gonna talk later about how one might leverage this kind of ranking. Also, one thing that is very useful here is a churn is really the binary classification version of customer value prediction. So let me tell you a bit what I mean here. So again, I'm showing this timeline where you have all this historical data on a customer. So you know when they registered, purchase, click emails, all those things. And now let's say, I wanna predict in the next six months what they're gonna do. So you can predict if they're going to engage again, period. So are they going to churn or not? So that's what we call binary classification problem because you're predicting a yes or no question. And so that is churn basically. Or you can also predict how much will this person spend in that same time period, right? If the person churns, the spend will be zero. If they don't churn, then they'll have some non-zero spend. So that's, that's what we call a regression problem. So instead of predicting a binary yes or no, you're predicting a number. And the cool thing here is you can use almost the exact same model to predict these two things. You just need to either put it in classification mode or regression mode. Um, so what I mean by that is all this data you have from the past, the, you know, the data on their purchasing, their email clicking, all that stuff, all those features you've gathered can be used in the exact same way to predict if someone's going to churn or if they're going to spend. Um, so let's say you build a random forest model using all of that data. You can do a random forest classification to answer the first question, and you can use a random forest regression to answer the second, based on the exact same historical data points from each customer. So there are a few different modeling strategies for solving these problems. I'm going to focus on this first one called, um, I'm calling here the sliding box model, and it'll become evident in later slides why I call it that. Um, this is a traditional machine learning method. So you have historical data points on each customer and you engineer features from it and you put those into something like a random forest or, or a you know, linear regression or something, and then you get out an answer. So that's the simplest and most straightforward way. Um, it works really well. If you're a Python person, um, a good package for this is called scikit-learn um, that has a lot of these traditional machine learning models in it. So that's predicting what someone's going to do over some fixed period of time. So the next six months, the next year, it's predicting things on like a very finite time scale. Another way to predict churn and customer value is to actually go for it and try to actually predict 
really far out in the future, try to actually get a measure of the lifetime behavior of this customer. And something you can use for that is called survival analysis. And in Python, there's a library for that called Lifelines. Um, so this is modeling, it's, it's usually called time to death in survival analysis because it's often used to predict actual death. So this was used traditionally in medical fields. Um, but what this kind of modeling does is it tries to figure out for different kinds of customers and different subgroups it places them in, um, what are your odds of dying at any point in the future? So um, it's this uh, survival curve that it predicts. So it's like a probability of churning at any given point in the, in the future. And so that's a good way to get, um, you know, both someone's churn probability as a function of time, but then also how long are they going to stay with you? And in that time, how much will they spend? Um, and if you want to go real fancy, you can use your current neural network. So there are ways to model um, the time to the next event. So if you have all the data on someone and you want to predict when will they buy again, um, you can use fancy time series methods. You can use your current neural networks for that. But I'm going to focus on this first, uh, first type of model, the sliding box model, because it, it really gets you what you need for most use cases here. So um, just, to, just to make sure we're on the same page about the nomenclature here. So supervised machine learning is when you have a bunch of examples where you know the answer of what happened in the past, and then you train an algorithm to be able to predict that in the future. So you have what I'm gonna call features so that's all that historical data on your customers that you can put into a model to make a prediction. So that's stuff like demographics and you know when they signed up and how much they've been purchasing in the past. Those are what I'm calling features. You also have some sort of algorithm, some, some sort of mathematical function that takes in all those numbers you give it, um, and then it, it predicts some sort of output. And you might say like, well, demographics aren't numbers, but there are, um, there are ways in machine learning to convert them into numbers. And then there are what I'm calling your labels. So that's the outcome you're predicting. So for churn, that's a yes or no um, in a computer, it's a one or a zero. So that's telling you like, does this person churn in the next six months or not? And that's the label. So in your historical data, where you know if people churned or not, you assign people one or a zero based on if they churned. And then when you're trying to predict it in the future, your model is gonna give you a number between zero and one that gives you some measure of how likely they are to churn. So this is why I'm calling it the sliding box method because you're basically taking the timeline and you're splitting it into chunks. And so that's what's represented by these boxes. So um, again, the features are all the pieces of data you're putting into your model. And that can be a linear regression, that can be a random forest, it can be as complicated or simple as you want. And then the labels are the things you're predicting. And again, with a supervised learning model, you need a lot of examples where you know the right answer. So. One, let's say hypothetically, we wanted to build this model from the data that we have. And let's say we have data um, of 2020 and then 2021 so far. So what we can do is say, all right, let's create all these features from 2020 data. So let's take everything we know about customers during the year 2020 and put those into features. So during 2020, what were their demographics? How many times did they click, order, email? Usually want to bin it in time. So like how much did they buy in December, November, October, like going back in time. So those are all features. Those are all numbers that get fed into your model. So let's say we build that all from the year 2020. Then let's say the labels are, did people churn or not in the first six months of this year? So January through June of 2021. So basically what you've done here in this timeline is you've divided it into these two chunks where the features are the year 2020 and the labels are the first six months of this year. And that's where you know the answer, right? Because we're, it's been more than six months. So you have all this data. 
So now you have all these examples where you know what someone did in, in 2020, and then you know if they churned or not in the first six months of 2021. So you know the right answer. So that's basically the two boxes that you have here is the features and the labels. So for the features, um, you'll have certain things that are time dependent and not time dependent. So demographics are, are usually not time dependent, but sometimes they are. Um, the days that, since initial signup can be useful because that kind of tells you how long term a customer has been. And that can be a really important factor of like whether or not they'll churn or spend with you in the future. But then like by far the most important kind of feature are the ones that tell you about customer engagement. And it's not just purchasing, it's like all engagement on whatever kind of site or service or anything you have. So it can be clicks, orders, email opens. Um, and then you want these things as a function of time. So you wanna say how many um, clicks did they have in the last month? What about in the last 90 days, the last year? So you, you aggregate those things in different windows. And the reason why is because the more recent activity is a better predictor than older activity. So, you know, what someone did on your site like six years ago is probably not going to be a great predictor of how active they're going to be now. But how active someone was one month ago is going to be a pretty good predictor of, of how active they're going to be now. So this feature box, I know in my hypothetical example, I made it a whole year. It doesn't even need to be that long. It really depends on the parameters of your business. If you have the kind of business where your customers are daily active users, then your feature window might not need to be very long. But if you, instead you have a business where, um, you know, for example, uh, where people are buying clothing or home goods or something like that, where they don't purchase that frequently, you might want this feature window to go back even farther so that you just get more information um, yeah, on that longer time window. And then I also want to mention that a kind of feature that can go into this that is particularly pertinent right now are um, what I'm calling exogenous variables. So um, that could be measures of the broader financial climate. So there can be things that impact customer behavior that are not related to your business. And they're, they're not related to that customer. They're really more related to what's going on in the world and things that you have no control over. And those can be, um, those can provide useful context for your model. And that's particularly interesting for the last year and a half um, during the pandemic, because that's dramatically changed the way people purchase, um, both you know, in stores, online, um, what kinds of things they're buying. So if there's some way that you can capture those trends in some sort of number that you can put into your model, the better. Um, so those are the feature side of things. And then the labels are well, we've talked about before, if you're predicting churn, you want to know, did this person have activity or were they just absent? And then for customer value, how much did this person spend in this time period? So effectively, you would be predicting, um, you know, in our six month example, given everything we know from the year 2020, how much did this person predict in the first six months of 2021? Um, can we build a model that can do that? And then can we get that same model? Can we run it on current data and predict the next six months from now? That's the goal. So um, one complication here um, for anyone who's done machine learning before is you know that you don't just need um, the data that you train the model with, the examples that the model sees, but you also need a separate testing data set so that you can figure out how well your model worked. So um, you need a training set and a testing set. I'm not gonna talk about validation data sets, but that's also another data set you should usually have. Um, so it's tempting to say like, okay, I will create this data set from the last 18 months, and then I will divide into training and testing data sets based on like randomly selecting users. So I can say like, let's take 70% of my customers and train a model based on that and take another 30% of my customers and then test on that. 
So it's very, um, that is the easiest thing to do and it will still lead to um, probably a decent model, but it won't necessarily be as robust of a model because you might overfit to this time period. So as you know, how customers spend um, is very dependent on you know, the, the broader economic climate, it's dependent on your product and marketing strategy, it's dependent on a lot of things that are time sensitive. So the danger of just using one time window to build and test your model is that you might get an overly optimistic view of how well your model works because it's only based on one specific time window. Ideally, what you wanna do is simulate as closely as possible what happens in the real world where you train on one time window. And then if you want to say, okay, how well does that model generalize to other time periods? Then you have a testing data set that's from a different time window. So the features and labels, as you see, they've been, they've, uh, they're sliding, right? So they, they started out farther in the past. Now for the testing data set, they're sliding forward a bit. And then once you leverage this model on current data to predict the future, it'll slide forward even more so that this feature label barrier is today. So that's the idea here. So in terms of modeling strategies here, um, you can go very simple. You can do you know, linear regression, um, but it's been found in the literature that very straightforward nonlinear models tend to work well. So I've mentioned random forest a few times in, in the past, like that's, um, you know, in scikit-learn, it can do classification and regression. Um, it's been found to work very well for these types of problems. Um, and it can also handle numerical and categorical um, types of features that you put in, which is nice. Um, and it's, it's not as prone to overfitting as maybe some other kinds of models. Um, as I mentioned before, it's crucial to test the performance of this in a real world scenario. So you want to simulate as closely as possible with your historical data, how you're going to use the model in the future. So that's why, you know, you have these sliding boxes where you're training data is from a time period farther in the past and you're testing data is from a different time period that's more recent. You want to see how well does my model that I built on, you know, data from way back when, how well does that generalize to more recent data? And then you also have to watch out for what's called concept drift. So this is a concept in machine learning where um, models will stop working as well when the fundamental thing they're modeling is changing. So this happens a lot in all kinds of models, but in particular for um, time series models, it's going to change whenever, um, again, like the economic, the external economic climate changes, whenever your business or product or marketing strategy changes, whenever any of those things change, they change the game of how people's past behavior is a predictor of their future behavior. And so it's useful to retrain these models on a regular basis so that um, you can make sure that it's keeping up with changes in that strategy. So, you know, every um, month or two, it can be a good idea to retrain these models, maybe less frequently if it's a less chaotic time. So I only have a few minutes left. I'm gonna talk about now, like if you did ha now have a model that can predict these things, what can you do with that model? So, um, Using your model in production for this can be just super simple. Um, these are the kinds of things where you don't need a real-time API giving you up to the minute scores. It's not like predicting trending tweets in Twitter. This is the sort of thing that moves slowly. Like people purchase and interact um, you know, more infrequently, like a daily cadence of scoring people can be enough. So you can do this all offline. That's what I recommend. So if you have a model, what you can do is just have an automatic like cron job or something like every day where um, you just, every night you pass people through the model again, update their scores and just put them in a database. And if you put all these scores in a database, um, 
you can keep them as a function of time and you can look at how people's scores have changed over time, which can be very interesting. But then also if you just have people accessing this data directly in a database, um, it'll be uh, easy for people to do all kinds of analytics on it. Um, but then also if you're gonna do a marketing campaign and you want to like figure out who to send it to, that can translate into a very simple uh, SQL query to a database. So you can say like, all right, I want to send a marketing campaign to people who I know like to buy shirts. And I want to, you know, rank people by churn score and leverage that in who I send this to. So what you can do is just search in your database for shirt people and then rank them by churn score. And um, right, it turns into a pretty simple query. But you can also have, you know, some sort of web application in front of it that can also be useful. Um, you can have an API where, you know, someone gives a user ID, they get back a churn score. So there are ways to make this fancier, but at the simplest level, just having a table in a database that people can query is usually the easiest way. And then um, one thing that I've seen a lot is these, um, especially churn scores being misused for marketing. So a common thing people will do is take people and rank them by their churn score and say like, okay, I'm going to take the top probability to churn folks and I'm going to target those people. But that's usually a waste of time. Um, people who are at the top of your churn list, who have the highest churn scores, are probably a lost cause. They're probably not coming back, especially if your business has been around for a long time. Um, you might have some people in your um, database who haven't interacted with you for years. So it's going to be really hard to reactivate those people. You might want to, not to say that that's a terrible thing to do. You might specifically have targeted marketing campaigns that, that are meant for reactivating deactivated users and that you can definitely leverage the churn scores to do that. But I just want to point out that different parts of that list are for different purposes. So on this, uh, in this graph here, on the horizontal axis, I have the churn risk. So low churn is on the left and then high churn risk is on the right. And then on the Y axis, I have some, some measure of customer value. So it could be like how much do they spend in the recent past? It could be a customer value prediction. Um, so the high value is at the top, low value is at the bottom. So in this graph, people who are way to the right, these are the people with the highest churn risk. These are the people who are probably a lost cause. Like I said, they could be the target of a reactivation strategy, but they're gonna be harder to get back than other customers. Whereas on the left side, you have the people who are not gonna churn. And so um, at the top, you have what I'm calling your power users. So these are people who are very active, high value customers. And then um, in the bottom left, I have people who are, who are very safe, but they're, they are lower value. So um, ways to treat these people is uh, the safe but lower value folks. Um, you could implement strategies to try to get them to start spending a bit more. Um, but with both of these groups, the low churn groups, you need to be very cautious um, about giving them promo codes. Um, because these are people who you are very confident are going to purchase again. So if you do give them promo codes, just know that um, those might go towards purchases they would have made anyway. So just, you know, exercise some caution when you're doing stuff like that. And then in the middle of the graph towards the top is what I'm calling kind of like the ROI sweet spot. So these are people where you have indicators that they um, are or would be very high value customers, but they're kind of in the middle of the churn risk list. So they're not safe and they're not a lost cause. They're kind of like those customers who kind of need like a, a nice nudge to, um, to become more loyal and they'll start spending more. So this is also like a crucial part of this chart. These are people who can be really high value if they're targeted in the right way. And what constitutes like the sweet spot middle of that churn risk list can be the subject of experimentation. So what I recommend people do is A-B tests where they say like, okay, let's take, 
you know, the second decile down of the churn list and put it against the third decile down, you know, and like kind of test those groups against each other to see which one gives you the best advertising ROI. So that's all I had. Um, happy to take any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Allie. So we do have a ton of questions that have come in. Um, okay. Everyone on the call, if you have questions, uh, please use the Zoom Q&A. Feel free to add them as we start powering through. So uh, first question, uh, Pierre Marco has two questions. Uh, just to articulate on my previous question, oh, actually, here, I'll go to the I have to, I'm not sure the order they were in here. Uh, let's start with this one. I'm curious to know if actions derived from these analyses do affect future analyses. For example, if I, if from the back of a churn analysis, I manage to re-engage someone, won't that analysis be misleading in the future? How do you factor that in? Oh, that's a super good question. Yeah, so um, that is totally right. Um, you will, by um, doing any kind of marketing with your customers or any kind of outreach, you will affect the data set for the future. And just keep in mind that that's going to happen from past data as well, just in general from marketing. So if you did have like promo code campaigns in the past and people responded to those, that data might you know end up going into training one of these models. So my suggestion is to just log everything you possibly can. So um, if you can categorize um, purchases people make, if you can do some kind of attribution. So if you can try to like tag purchases by like, okay, this person had a promo code or this person was a part of like this specific sale or campaign and like have that in your data then you can represent that in the data that you use to train your model. So you can say like, okay, how many, um, how many just like regular purchases did this customer have? How many promo code purchases did they have? And then how many sale purchases did they have? So if you can kind of categorize the different kinds of purchases by attributing that marketing influence to them, then that can help you. But that's totally correct. Like any kind of interactions with your customers that you do will be reflected in this data set. And there's always going to be some margin of error for, for that happening. Okay. Um, so Kevin asks, do these so these predictions depend on public data, analytics data, customer data, and product lifetime value or expiry date. For example, would an airline look for yearly churn depending on seasonal vacations, food delivery might look at weekly orders and so on. Um, they, like how does it kind of change by business verticals? Oh yeah, no, that's totally right. That's a very good instinct. It, it, it does change and it depends on the seasonality of business. So like I said, like there are some businesses where, um, for example, um, with shop renter is more like luxury clothes and people, I mean, some people do, but most people don't buy that every day. Whereas there are some businesses where you have like Spotify, um, you know, you want to have daily active users on Spotify or like airlines, people will book on an airline maybe once a year. So that seasonality and that time window for interactions is a huge factor in how you build your model. So I talked before about um, kind of like binning activity on a time horizon. So saying like, how much did someone buy in the last month or the month before that? Um, but that time window doesn't have to be months. For some businesses, it can be weeks and for some others, it can be years. So it all depends on what's the seasonality of the business that you have um, how often do people tend to purchase? And that's something that you can see in your historical data. So look at your historical data and see what's the purchase frequency of my customers? What does that histogram look like? And then how does that, how does the number of purchases change as a function of, you know, week, month, year? Um, so you can really get at like, what's the right timeline to use for that? Um, but yeah, that's a really good question. That's a really important factor. And then when you're trying to like predict the future, um, folding in that seasonal effect can be very useful too. So um, the month that you're dealing with, um, let's say it's something like airline travel where people tend to travel more in the summer and winter. One of the ingredients to your model can be what month it is. So that's one of those like exogenous variables that I mentioned. So your model will learn 
if I'm predicting in July, um, I need to boost things a bit or boost the customer value, maybe depress the churn scores as opposed to like other months later in, in the year, like in an off cycle. So that that can be another factor in your model. Okay, great. So uh, Mackenzie asks um, to account for COVID, which is probably on a lot of people's minds, um, would it be better to have an encoded feature where the date is marked as COVID impacted or COVID not impacted? Um, or um, you, she said, uh, would, would putting saying the, I'm not sure this means the SPY value help to account for COVID given that the market was so impacted by COVID, this way you have one feature that could account for the macroeconomics in COVID. Yes, no, that's, that's exactly what I was trying to, um, what, what I very briefly mentioned before, but if you can take those macroeconomic factors and try to boil it down to like a number or a few numbers that you can put in, or it can be a binary variable, like, yeah, was this date impacted? But if you can have like some sort of measures of how much of an impact to your industry was there from COVID on that date compared to maybe the past, um, then that will be really useful. So one thing you can do is, um, for example, talking about airlines again, if you have data going back really far in the past, um, maybe you can take, um, you know, annual data and stack it on itself and see like, okay, what, if we were going to say like on this date, what was the, the level of COVID related depression based on like compared to what we see historically, maybe you can have like a, a depression factor. So say like, we know that sales on this date are you know seventy percent of what they should have been given the past few years trends? That factor can be a part of your model, so that's like a really great way to to account for that. But yeah, I think accounting, trying to do, build any of these models right now is going to be much 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 harder than they were a year and a half ago, or I guess two years ago because of COVID nineteen. Yeah. So someone had mentioned um, that you were mostly talking about and showing using Python for modeling. Um, mm -hmm. They're just assuming that R is, um, is it, can you use R for the same thing? Totally, yeah, you can definitely use R. Um, actually, uh, I, I yeah, I guess I'm, I'm just like more of a Python person now, but I, I probably should have mentioned the tools in R, but um, when I built the, so I built customer lifetime value and churn modeling system at Groupon and I used R for that. So R has all these same models. It also has survival. I think it has survival analysis, but what I used back then was a random forest model and I, I did it all in R. So yeah, okay. definitely it's easy to do. Um, and I'm not sure if you're gonna be able to answer this one, but uh, someone asked, just curious in your work at Amazon, do most of your testable ideas come from tech teams and data scientists or from marketing teams? Yeah, so I'm not on the dot-com side. So I actually cannot, tell you that um, I, I also um, just, yeah, probably can't speak to, to any of our business practices, but um, I'm on the Amazon web services side where uh, we do things kind of differently. So yeah, I can't okay. speak to that, sorry. Um, how would you define someone as being active on an e-commerce website where usage is not regular? Can you repeat that please? Uh, how would you define someone being active on um, an e-commerce website where usage is not regular? I think this is going to your yeah. point where they may only purchase, you know, once or twice a year. This is the whole issue with predicting churn in those cases. So yeah, if someone only buys once or twice a year and then they don't buy for six months, are they really churned or are they just haven't? Are they, you know, are they, are they, are they dormant? Some, yeah. yeah, they're just like a little dormant. Yeah, so that's, so in those cases, this, these modeling problems are going to be way harder. So the longer the time lapse between, and this, again, this is something that you can look at using historical data. So take all your customers, for every customer, figure out what their average time between purchases is. Um, and then for all of your customers, look at a histogram of that. And if your average time between purchases is like six months to a year, um, it doesn't mean that the problem's intractable. It just means it's more difficult. So the reason why it's more difficult is those boxes in the sliding box model have to be much, much bigger. So whereas like if you're expecting daily active users, you can make that labels box 
you know, just like a month maybe and be very safe and that you're really capturing a churn event or it's a non-event, but if people only buy once a year, that churn definition is probably going to be like, did someone buy, you know, is someone going to buy in the next like year or two? Like it, like those yeah. time windows just have to keep getting longer, the longer the lag between purchases. And so that's what makes this kind of problem harder. Um, but if again, like your goal is to just rank your customers in terms of how risky they are, you can still just predict in the next six months or a year, um, really what you're doing is you're predicting, is this person going to buy in the next six months or a year? And so you're still going to get out a useful score that's still useful for ranking people. So, so it's not, um, you know, necessarily the end of the world, but yeah, you should probably, if you can make those box timelines bigger. Okay. Awesome. Well, we are out of time. So thank you everyone for joining and especially Allie, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and wisdom. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thanks, everyone. Okay, everyone will have a great week and we'll see you at our next SD SDEC session. Thanks so much. Thank you.